So welcome to episode seven, the seventh, which means that we've all been in lockdown much longer than any of us really hoped for or, or expected. Um, but uh, we've got an amazing, amazing chat lined up for everybody uh, this afternoon. So we've got four guests, so it's a slightly different format. Um, we've had a couple of guests for the last few weeks, but I decided to fill the room with amazing people so that we could all have a, have a lovely, uh, lovely gossip this afternoon. So um, I'm just gonna go around and, and uh, briefly introduce you to everybody. Um, Cause I think one of the, one of the uh, bits of feedback that I've been getting from all kinds of people uh, over the last few weeks is that although it's amazing to hear from uh, people uh, who are a long way down their career and, and Blake certainly is with his. It's also really interesting to hear kind of different takes, different perspectives. So people who are coming into music to picture, maybe from uh, performing or from uh, electronic music from, from a band background. Um, so so we've, got, we've got a wide range, a wide range, diverse opinions. Um, so just to say hello to everybody, the first, uh, First person that I've got on my little screen here is Mr. Blake Neely. Hello to you, Mr. Blake Neely. Hello. <laughs> so Blake has very kindly been be is beaming in from LA, where the time is currently seven o two a.m., which is usually when I leave the studio. Oh my God! Yeah. So uh, Blake and I, uh, as will become clear, have known each other for uh, quite a twenty-five bit of, years. Twenty-five years. And in that time, I've never really known him ever sleep. So maybe, maybe <laughs> after this is finished, there might be a first time for everything. Uh, but thank you very much, Blake. We will be coming to you for, for questions, anecdotes, and uh, hoping that you won't say anything uh, that, well, at least I can edit out of the YouTube video if you do say something. Oh, you're hoping, you're hoping a lot. <laughs> it's gonna go horribly <laughs> wrong. Uh, so next in the little window, uh, Kate Simcoe. Kate, who is so amazing. Uh, Hello. So, uh, Kay, I think, did we first meet even before you came across to the RCM? Did we have a coffee and a gossip? Ages we did. And ages. That's right. We did, with, with Elizabeth Mitchell. That's right. So, yeah, so that's how we met, through Elizabeth. We, uh, she took us, the two of us, to coffee and to meet, and yeah, she's lovely. She's a good friend. Which is amazing. And, and then you subsequently, you did come across to London and did, did the course. I did. Yeah, I did. Um, so I moved here in 2012 to get my master's in composition for screen. And uh, yeah, and then I yeah, we were in touch again from there, I guess. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I think, I, I think one, of, one of the joys of, of doing uh, these little chats is uh, sitting here in the morning, sort of trying to uh, wrangle everybody together and get them the information, but sitting here with Spotify on listening to everybody's stuff whilst, uh, whilst having the first drink of the day. It's amazing. So uh, if if everybody who of the 107 people on the on the chat right now, 108, somebody's going to finally come. The uh, uh, if you're not following all of our guests on on social media and also checking out their their work as well, you're you're missing out because there's some some beautiful work being made. Uh, next along the Rogues Gallery is Mr. Tom Gray. Hello there, Mr. Tom Gray. Hello. <laughs> so. Tom, with a background uh, as, as a, a key influential part of the band Gomez, the Mercury Prize winning band Gomez, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so Tom, you kind of, uh, did, do you think that you, you're making a transition now or have fully made a transition into music to picture or, or is, is it just whatever comes along? Michael, I'm, I'm entirely a dilettante at everything that I do, you know, including <laughs> rock and roll. Um, it's, um, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love writing songs and occasionally I've been lucky enough where friends and, and, and collaborators have asked me to put music on their TV and film as well. Um, and similarly with theatre and writing songs for theatre, which I'm doing a lot of as well. So, I mean, it's, 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 I, I am not the person to talk to about how to build a career because my career is a confusing and silly thing. <laughs> it seems to just, it's more like a barrel rolling down a hill than anything else. Occasionally bouncing off strange objects <laughs> and then careering into, into a different thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I think there's, there's a lot of, um, 
it's become we, we we've had a lot of chats about sort of like career development so sort of mid-career development early development how did you break in all of those kind of uh uh, sort of conversations which are obviously very important uh, and at the top of the mind for people who are you know kind of just starting out but also I think I think there's there's something uh, that is intriguing at the moment about talking to people who haven't come from the background maybe that Blake and I did which is sort of coming up through the ranks and, um, and we'll talk about that um, together I'm sure but um, I I you know, I think it's an amazing thing. I think it's probably sort of, um, you know, the, the voices that are coming into film and telly right now, for me, are super exciting because there's definitely more than one way to, to skin a cat. And, and I know, uh, referring back to the chat with David Arnold and Dan Pemberton, uh, we, we, we <laughs> were you cross with Dan or was he cross with you? Well, no, no, nobody yeah, was no, cross with anybody. No, no one was cross with anybody. There's, there's no crossness. Um, no, no crossness. Dan, Dan happened to say that, I think he said something a little bit um, throwaway about um, artists getting in on the act, you know, uh, maybe being, not being judged in the same way. Um, and I can understand that. I think that's true. The thing is that I, 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 I don't think I, any of my scoring jobs have really come to me because of what I did as a band member. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so um you know, I was Gomez are a funny old band. A lot of a lot of really hardcore fans, but we weren't like a super cool. Hey, let's! I need to buy in on their cred for my TV show. Kind of a band. It's not oh, I see. really that kind of a thing. Um, um, so it's it's when I've got jobs, it's generally come through meeting people and them thinking foolishly <laughs> that to be involved with them. Find them enough drink at the time <laughs> and then getting them to sign something before they go home well yeah essentially that's uh, that's that's my negotiating position generally speaking and, um, and, and a very strong one indeed uh, i'm just going to skip over so that i can introduce our our final video uh, participant hello anna anna phoebe um, again another amazing uh background and voice to sort of like to to be hearing more of in you know, in uh, music to picture now, or uh, as a recording artist too, because because uh, it's for you. It was you've got lens flare, Anna. How did you just get lens flare? <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. It it suddenly turned into Cloverfield, or one of those one of those trendy films. Um, uh, but you uh, were touring. Was being a sort of like a a, a a violinist that could play in a thousand styles was was that sort of where it started out for you or was that again accidental no. as, as... It, well it didn't i mean I, I think i'd probably um i think i would i would think of myself more like along the the, the tom kind of uh, career path where I, I think i was just been an opportunist and i've said yes to things that i feel like i've never been qualified to say yes to and then i just work fucking hard to make sure <laughs> I go. that is the and first I'm... f bomb good job Sorry. you did it she did it <laughs> <laughs> So I actually, studied, I, I actually studied social policy in government. I went to the London School of Economics and I wanted Did to be a politician. You? I worked for the Labour Party. Yeah. And it was while I was, uh, while I was studying in London, I kind of, emerged, I, I grew up in a really small village up in Scotland. And so I just, I almost didn't care what I studied. I, I did all my grades and I got offered a place at the Royal Academy in Scotland to do, to do, to play violin. But um, I just wanted to get to London. And I, every night I was, um, uh, going to music, open mic nights, band nights. If I, if I liked the musicians, I'd be like, oh, I'll come record for free for you. I'll come, you know, then I hosted music nights. I just kind of really put myself out in the London music scene. At the same time, I was working for Yvette Cooper at Westminster while she was the junior health minister. And then I went on tour with my uncle, a goth punk band. And suddenly I found myself as a violinist um, uh, playing uh at like a goth festival in berlin where oh, ramstein was like headlining and i was just like this is so much more fun <laughs> than <laughs> politics God, so I, and then from there i kind of got i got a job like i just said yes to auditions you know i got a gig in america which kind of set me up because um it, it was it was incredibly like it was really well paid which meant that i could afford to kind of just do music i was on tour for three months three four months of the year and then i was kind of doing other stuff always writing music releasing like self-releasing stuff 
So it just kind of, um, I would say it's a really organic, organic process um, yeah. of saying yes, even, you know, like with Roxy Music, I'd never played, I'd never played keyboards on stage before and suddenly I had a Moog and then I had like two sets Excuse of keyboards yeah. and then my violin is and I remember saying yes, and I thought, oh my God, no one must ever know how hard I've worked. <laughs> learning, those, learning those parts. So I feel, um, and then the same with, I've always collaborated with people. I've always loved oh, yeah. working with, with people. So I, I think that's kind of, I think it's curiosity. That's how I built my career, curiosity and, and hard work. And, and just being optimistic. When a door shuts, you just climb back on and you do something else. Do you know, I th it's, that's super inspiring because I, th I think, um, and and I sort of I, I kind of apolog slightly apologise to the to the chat room for for last week where I got a bit engrossed and didn't really chat to everybody as much as possible. But uh, it's kind of like sh now now I would say that really I, th I think we should have a little shout out to the chat room. So everybody who who is down in the chat room, by the way, if you are using the ch chat room, please change the preference to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see you. Um, but the, I think there's a really sort of um, uh, positive message for for having you know four amazing artists on on screen join us today all totally different all kind of doing things their own way and uh it, it's sort of um i i think that that diversity of way in kind of gives a diversity of music out as well because i mean going going back to, to blake for a minute just uh while he has a coffee the <laughs> Did you play? Did you start uh, at Disney? Was I? Am I right in thinking that you were doing copying before we met, or was it? Uh, uh, was it? It was a publishing house, wasn't it? Which I started. Well, I interned at Disney when I was that's in college. It. Yeah, that's it. And then I got my first job at their record company, Hollywood Records, which was I'll admit to everyone on this was a horrible job, but I was working in music, so I'm like, that's great. And then I worked for two years and wrangled my way over to publishing. And then through publishing, I started meeting a lot of composers. So when I left Disney, I had a relationship, not, not a big relationship, but similar, a somewhat relationship with Michael Kamen and a lot of other composers. And he was looking for a, um, he was looking to, you were there at the yeah, time, Mike. Me and James, that's right. And Kamen was, was going, he was going to do, a tour of all of his film scores and he was looking for someone to put together his entire library and I was the guy and uh, he reached out and that was it and so after I mean I worked for Michael for a couple of years just putting together his um, library to go on tour talking with Michael Price every once in a while and him saying you're you're a idiot. <laughs> Just those, um, those late late night phone calls or early morning for you. It's like, what's this? Can you get it together? You idiot? <laughs> um, and those then this days. one night, I got this call from Michael, and he said, "Hey, you you must be an orchestrator." I wasn't, yeah. but I said, "Yeah, sure." And he said, "Well, we're doing this little concert with this little band, Metallica. And I'm gonna send you a chart. Can you can you do it?" <laughs> And I said to my wife, I'm, you're not going to see me for the next two days because I'm just going to nail this. And yeah. that was it. Like we, we did this concert with Metallica. I orchestrated a chart. I sent it to Michael. He's like, great, I'm going to send you three more. And Michael, Michael Price is like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> just to, just to fill everybody in <laughs> just to fill everybody in on the on the backstory there so uh, i uh, i worked for michael came for five years al along with another brilliant composer called james brett and um, and so we we were the the london end of the operation because michael came and lived in london and uh, and, and so we we would find ourselves sort of uh, at the at the center of some very complicated storms, a lot of the time, with a lot of people in a lot of different time zones, and uh, and and just trying to sort of uh, keep the keep the show on the road. But my, actually, my favorite story about Metallica was uh, not whether or not your charts were any good, Blake. They were fine. Believe me, they were fine. But it was the takedown that you did of the Morricone tune overnight in the hotel oh, before geez. the concert. So, so we, yeah. So we get to San Francisco. And and they're rehearsing, and they're like, "Well, we always come out to uh, Ecstasy of Gold, Ecstasy of Gold by you know Morricone. We always come out to that. Where is it? 
and Michael <laughs> looks around. I'm like, I'm on it, I'm on it. So I go to uh, Amoeba Music Records in San Francisco, and I find the album, I buy the album, I take it to where I'm staying, which is my brother's place, uh, and I just do a takedown. I just like spend all night writing it down exactly what's played, and I come back the next day, and um, and we go to rehearse, and Michael looks at me, he goes, is this gonna be all right? And I'm like, I think so. <laughs> and, they, and he goes, and we yeah. play it, yeah. And it's and it 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 is what it That's is. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm standing on the edge of the stage, and my favorite moment in my entire career <laughs> is all four members of Metallica surround me and give me a noogie on my head. <laughs> uh, believe, believe me, my friend, it does not get better than that, and it and it never will. It's not better than that. <laughs> the rest of it's all downhill. I gotta go. And you know, to Kirk, oh. Kirk and I still talk. No, after all these years. Oops, yeah. Oops. Of course you do. do you Nuggy hang? on the head. Come, come on. on. Celebrity parties. Kay, I'm gonna come <laughs> I'm gonna come to you because the the world the world of kind of like uh, electronic performance and, and DJing and uh staying up really as a as a as a dad now, two kids, staying up past about half past nine is is very foreign to me right now. Because mm. did so did you start out as a uh, a producer first, a DJ first? What what was the what was your kind of way in? So I studied uh, music at Northwestern. I did piano and then um, music technology, which was like composing um, with vintage synths. So that was that was amazing. They, they Northwestern was like Columbia, Princeton, and Stanford and stuff. But they had the original 1970s sort of grants from the U.S. government. So the uh, U.S. Oh. government, sorry. And so that was amazing. So we had like a whole wall of modular oh. moves and Amazing. Professors that barely could use Logic Audio or anything, they just knew that <laughs> stuff and were like, place the tape, you know, but it was amazing. I really uh-huh. learned how the waveforms work and how to create electronic music um, from that perspective and music concrete. But I started going to raves and from the dance music side, I was already into electronic music in Chicago is where I grew up. So Chicago uh-huh. house and techno. So I was studying that, but was DJing on the radio. So I started buying vinyl and I started, I got my own radio show. And so it was DJing. And then um, I thought that I was going to move to LA and, you know, work my way up um, more similar to what Blake was saying. But um, the way things worked out, it was uh, in the middle of a recession. Yeah. And I ended up selling cars at Volkswagen Santa Monica. Good for you. I Somebody made a has lot to... <laughs> money. I could buy all my equipment. I had no equipment. I had like yeah, one yeah. turn table and I borrowed some cents and I was running out of money. I was interning for free and I, inter- I could only intern for free for like six months. I mean, anyway, so I stayed yeah. in LA for a bit and I just wanted to make my own music. So I really wanted to learn how to make my own music and yeah. I just couldn't see my way to survive in Los Angeles, getting experience and making my own music. So I moved yeah. back to Chicago where it was cheaper and I, I, I knew I could kind of navigate that. And um, so that's what I did. I, I, and then from there though, I didn't do composition for film or TV really. I just, I toured internationally as a DJ, which yeah. was great. That was yeah. my 20s, you know? Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I have a child as well now. And, you know, <laughs> uh, it's not the same yeah, anymore, yeah. but yeah, so I did that and, um, and then after, you know, a certain point in a releasing a few albums and EPs and stuff, um, I released a film score and I really, really enjoyed it. And I, and I also realized my limitations, you know, I was playing flute, on, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. with my fingers on the top and, <laughs> you know, playing, you know, orchestrating strings, playing them like a pianist and, yeah. you know, not really knowing, you know, with, with the MIDI, it's so hard if you don't know how to use Sibelius and you don't have that background. Sure. It's so hard to look what the voices are doing. It's, and so, I mean, I don't want to make it, I'm not trying to complain. I'm just saying without, yeah, without yeah, training, yeah. I, I did realize I had hit my threshold of what I could do. Yeah. So that's why I moved here. And then I got my master's and I learned to, uh, you know, orchestrate. And I, I, combine my two worlds. <laughs> did, I was going to say, did, did you always have in mind that um, music to picture uh, would be something for you to be involved in later on, or was it one of those things where you sort of 
you you're just responding to what's around you and to changes in your in your own life you know into what all right how no, your life's about. I, I always really wanted to so when i did that undergrad where i was saying it's quite old school and everything else i really wanted to learn to score um you know how to do this my final you know graduation project was a film score and I ah, self-taught awesome. myself Pro Tools. They didn't teach Pro Tools. So <laughs> I was like, how about as my thing, like I learn how to use Pro Tools and I score a student film. And nice. you know, so that was, you know, so I really, I always wanted to since, you know, I just, it was just was, um, it just was like everyone said, I guess my career is like Tom. It's also been like a barrel rolling down the hill. Be like, oh, I, I have an offer to DJ and I have no offers for film scores. I guess yeah. I'm DJ, you know? Yeah, do some, do some hardcore <laughs> DJ. Like and, and I think we'll, we'll probably come back in, uh, in a bit and go, go round through um, how everybody is kind of coping, not, not just with the, with the shutdown, because that's sort of, uh, you know, bedding in quite a bit now, but also the kind of, the, the change of where everybody is in in what production looks like now and, and the sort of growth of streaming companies and 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 how everything is 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 moving on and whether and whether that is going to make a, a big difference for us all going forward and Tom do you think that kind of um, your experience do, do you feel like a different person now uh, than you did when you were in the band how how old were you when you were when you started in Gomez? Uh, I mean, I grew up around the corner from those lads, so right. I don't so know when I started in Gomez. It was, I mean, it, we all grew up in a square mile of each other. So it has always been. And it has always been. I can't leave. It's it's like a horrendous... It's <laughs> <laughs> a gold glue together. Pack. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, do you, do you feel now that the sort of... Um, I, I'm fascinated by, uh, by what I end up calling kind of... Uh, an integrated life where I felt for uh, the longest time that I did a lot of different things. I maybe even was a slightly different person in different circumstances when I was younger. And the sort of. You wrote dance music for a while. <laughs> I did. I, 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 hello. I, and very yeah, successful. <laughs> Oh, all right, so so here's my contemporary dance music background coming out. Thank you very much. Actually, I did notice, wasn't it? Uh, Anna, are, are you, do you write, this is my sort of crap Wikipedia, it's so transparent that I've been Wikipedia-ing everybody, but uh, Anna, do you, um, are you like resident composer at the Royal Ballet School or something like that? Is that even close to correct? Well, I, I don't know if I'm the resident composer, but I've, I've done, composer. Um, over the past few years, um, I've been working with the students, there's an amazing choreographer who does the contemporary dance section um, right. called Kate Flatt. Um, and she was actually, she's just retired. She's the, um, she's the original choreographer Les Mis, but then she's kind of, she did sort of, the, she was the starter of like move, movement direction. And her, she's got a really amazing approach, very open. And so I started going into, to do music with the students. And then I worked on, like, I've done maybe like six projects with them, which is, it's so incredible. And I think one thing, like, when you're writing music, not for yourself to perform on stage, it's such a different thing when you're, providing the narrative for some, well, because you're providing music for someone else's narrative. And the way contemporary dance, the way they think about music, it blew my mind. They don't hear music the same way that I, so I ended up writing some of the most um, interesting music that I've probably ever, ever written, just because they were like, oh, I need, I can't pirouette quick enough. Can you add one extra beat here? And oh, actually here, I need two more steps. I need two more beats. Do you kind of start creating this tapestry where you're like, whoa, this is my, my tempo map now when I'm going back to session. It's gone kind of insane. <laughs> Something I feel quite avant-garde. This is amazing. Exactly. Yeah. Amazing. We've gone yeah, way off the grid. Me, touch me in terms of writing. I, I, it's it's, wonder, it's wonder, like it's like when you get the when you get the new cut and they're like, can you just we just added like seven frames. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, shit. What, I, what I always used to say about because I, I used to play the piano for dance classes and and uh, that is uh, one of the ways that I started because I was a hopeless still am a hopeless sight reader but I had that sort of uh, whatever that thing is that means that you can just improvise and and so. That that actually, without making this about me, that that was one of the things that I used to do to make a few quid way before uh, meeting Michael Kamen was I used to play piano for contemporary dance classes, I and I did it. 
for year for years and years and years. And uh, the, the sort of yeah, but Michael, you put out like four contemporary dance albums, didn't you? Four or I mean, five. By the end, there were ten. I, I can't kid you oh, not. God, no. They're <laughs> great. They're fantastic. So but it, it was it was a very kind of natural progression. And this is way before streaming or any any of that kind of stuff um, for fully the internet. I don't. And uh, so I did I did something that that sounds probably very natural to everybody, which is that I used to play the piano, and then the the students or the dancers for the pro companies would go, "Can you make us a tape of what you've played? Because we need to rehearse when you're not here." And so I put a, a ghetto blaster on the top of the. Uh, piano, out tune piano, press record, play, and uh, and that would become a cassette. And then ten people would ask for the cassette, and then their friends would ask for it as well. And so the first releases, releases sounds very grand. The first w were cassettes with me <laughs> printing out labels at home and sticking them in. And but there was there was something about responding to. Uh, I always used to say about playing piano for dance classes, you knew whether or not you'd got it right or wrong because uh, they fell over if you got it wrong. It was it's like a very immediate response. <laughs> so if, you, if that tempo is not working, you don't get a producer note from, a, you know, sort of three weeks later going, well, maybe it could be a bit different. Dancers fall over, turn around and throw like smelly shoes and socks at you. Um, sorry, we we we, di <laughs> we digressed into contemporary dance. I, was, actually, I wanted to uh, I wanted to mention uh, I I was getting freaked out when Anna was talking because I started off in politics and and did politics and parliamentary studies at Leeds. I don't know if you remember. No that. way. Yeah, I did. Oh, and and I was gonna go and I I used to go and lick lick envelopes for Mo Molum and stuff in my childhood. Ah. And um, and so I I started off in politics and I wanted to be a speechwriter. That was what I wanted to do. That's where I thought I was gonna go. And then my mates that I grew up around the corner from just the stuff that we used to record together suddenly got a record deal and I was like oh this is different this sounds like more fun <laughs> and, and, and gone into this and now I can and the best thing is is that I can tie together even more of this because I played at Fuji Rock Festival after Rammstein oh, oh. <laughs> we tied together with a, a little how, bit how of, a little bit of Metallica in here as well, but I played after Ramstein, and Ramstein used to perform with a giant prosthetic penis. Oh, it was amazing! The shoes from yeah. Bessie, and also exactly. other things. Yeah, and they would spray the stage with prosthetic <laughs> semen, and and we there was only a ten minute changeover, and we had to come on stage in, in uh, you know under this glorious sight of of, of Mount Fuji, um, <laughs> stage covered in this thick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Once described it as, and I just sort of slid around, and it was getting our pedals, and oh god, it was quite an incredible experience. Anyway, hooray for Rammstein, hooray for former lives in politics. <laughs> oh, no, okay, wait, wait. Now, now that now that Tom has breached the uh, prosthetic penis story, <laughs> I don't have a story. <laughs> we'll hold that. One of the things that um, that I got on my on my list for us to chat about today was is there sort of um, there's prosthetic penis. <laughs> straight, hang on, it's like number number three. Sound yeah. <laughs> is the sort of, is the future because it, it felt like we've we've kind of um, I, I think for the first few weeks of being locked down, which has all felt very weird. There's a, a certain amount of kind of uh, worrying about that the past wasn't gonna it, things weren't gonna be how how they'd been and, and we sort of um uh we all start to make our peace with that in different ways but it, it's really interesting hearing all of your different takes on on what it's going to look like going forward and and, it, and in a way uh tom has, has been running a, uh, an amazing um campaign recently just on on twitter and Facebook, various other places, which I'll, I'll let him talk about. But I, I think that for me, the, the thing that's been important about um, what Tom's been talking about online is that it's about the future. It's about what what stuff, what's the industry going to be like for for composers and musicians in the future. What you know, how are we all going to be working in the future? Are we going to be working more remotely? Do we think is this going to stick? Actually, you know, is it is it going to change a lot of things? Uh, Kate, have you have you kind of um, got to the point yet in lockdown where where you've been 
thinking forward into the future or are you just as like uh, reasonably enough coping with the current madness? I, I just got there. So, you know, week seven is a good time to, to come on and join you guys. Um, yeah. yeah, I, I mean, my thoughts are that it's a good, good time to just be writing new music. Um, you know, in, you know, because if you, if you write more music, I mean, that's what we do. It's, it's, it's our product and it just gives you something to shout about. So, you know, I, I, that's, that's what I'm going to be doing right now because from what I understand, productions are pretty much closed down. You know, my composer agents aren't sending me things, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, to do right now. So I, I think it's a great time to make new music, um, orchestrate old stuff. I mean, even if you're going to re-release something and you reworked it, but come up with new things even better so that yeah. you have something to talk about and music to share with the world and you know it's it it creates a momentum you know you have to keep that momentum and i, I learned that when i had a child and i went on maternity leave or whatever else you, you just need to have something in music to keep yeah. you you know to keep that forward motion so for me personally i'm like okay great i'm just gonna write more music and i will release the music somewhere um i'll find the right label or perhaps uh, you know i'll put it on a demo reel if it really sounds like it's for film or tv or whatever but just keep writing but i mean it's economically it's scary but um yeah, yeah. you know you have to believe in yourself that it's you know your that our art our music is is a, our product in a way so you know just mm-hmm. keeping on going in the art creating something and it has value and you have to believe that that's amazing that i, I think that momentum point i find really really interesting because uh i i did the same thing uh uh, and took paternity leave um, over the last, uh, well, in theory, I was supposed to just be stopping paternity leave as we got locked down. But the, oh, wow. uh, but I, I found that there was a sort of a, like a two, a two stage thing with um, momentum. One was what you were actually doing, but then the second was the perception of what you were doing. And mm. so, because like with records or with film and telly, often it doesn't come out when you've done it. You sort of did it ages ago. Yeah. And, and I, I perhaps slightly cynically or wisely, depending on your opinion, um, w- did, did bear in mind the appearance of m- momentum in what was going on with my stuff. So I, when I knew I was going to take a break for a few months, I did line up some stuff to come out that I hadn't done then, yep. if you know what I mean. I think, we should also think about, I think we should also consider sound. Because we're at a we're at a moment where I was talking to an engineer and he's like, you know, I'm getting these remote sessions in and it's like eight different violin players with eight different microphones, eight different room tones. We're trying to make it sound like the orchestra used to sound. And it's like, why are we doing that? Why not just make it sound like it sounds? Like taken and yeah. we yeah. actually have a we have a potential of making a brand new sound of music. Yeah. Yeah. People are recording from eight different mics and eight different room tones and like what does that sound like and is this the sound of 2020 and i think that's really a cool way of doing it instead of trying to make it like sound like an orchestra it's not going to sound like an orchestra you're never going to make it sound like that they're not all pushing air at the same time so that's what i've been thinking about is like what does this afford us as artists of a new sound I, I think that I mean that's yeah. particularly interesting with having anna in the room who is like a, a proper legend at this sort of thing uh, on the uh, in terms of violin playing, in fact, we can we can see a beautiful remote recording setup just just behind you. <laughs> does, does, well, <laughs> no, listen, I I have but, two kids. I have a six year old and eight year old. This is the only apart from being locked in the toilet. This is the only place <laughs> they know. Not, so I was either going to do it from here or in the toilet. Or the so toilet. I, Either's fine. <laughs> we're, we're a very broad um, church here. I would say that I I kind of agree with with both what what mm. Kate and also Blake. What you've been saying, a combination of I think just keep going, but also I think like there's like a day by day thing, isn't there, happening right now? Like I remember when that first happened, I was like, okay, I'm gonna be homeschooling, and you try and kind of plan out, but actually I think that just messes with your head and it just gave me such anxiety, thinking yeah. like you've got to kind of think of this as a transition period. I think that's kind of helped me um, kind of cope with the day to day anxiety of like, oh my goodness, how long is this gonna go on for? What's the industry gonna look like at the other end? Mm-hmm. Um, and I also I think that. I think like Blake, what you were saying, using this time to kind of 
really um, connect with authenticity. And I think making using this as a time where you can make mistakes because people are very forgiving at the moment with what you present. Like yeah. I did, I did. Fortunately, with this chat. <laughs> well, in, well, maybe within this details. I feel like I feel like everyone's kind of in the same boat, and everyone has different coping mechanisms. I know that I'm a complete workaholic, and that I know that probably I'm reaching out to to loads of people that I would, you know, maybe haven't collaborated with before, or I'm working with people kind of also to fill the day. And maybe this is not like you know, a lot of it is not sustainable financially going forward yeah. at the moment. I, I don't have the creative mind space to kind of create things from scratch. Luckily, mm. I'm in a duo and we're working remotely. We're, we're working on a, on a new album. I've been doing sessions with people. I've been doing collaborations with people. Um, and I think that's kind of keeping me going. And then I think it's like the scary thought is like, what happens when this transition, this weird limbo phase, what happens when that ends? Like, you know, the, the campaign that Tom's doing with like the broken record and yeah. getting proper streaming rates like on, on, on royalties and, and I think it's um I think that's like such a huge conversation and sometimes I'm in the mood to talk about it and sometimes I just need to get through the day and not go yeah. crazy with uh, yeah. <laughs> my thoughts. So, absolutely. Uh bringing as neatly as if that was pre-planned to Mr. Tom Gray. <laughs> so Tom. Yeah, exactly. So bro so broken record. Uh I mean you, you and I have uh, have uh raised a glass at many uh industry event over the over the years and uh we've probably both seen a lot of uh, changes that are sometimes uh, there are un sort of unforeseen consequences I think or maybe they are foreseen from a lot of the industry changes so so things which at first sight seem like they're going to be a general good to turn out to be a specific good for, for certain people and not for others uh, and then there are unexpected uh, winners within that um, so can you give us a bit of a, a, a sort of like a, a potted headlines for, for broken record, if that's possible, for just... Uh, well, well, broken record isn't really that complicated. It's yeah. really, the, at the moment, um, we are reduced down to streaming. The, the, the live scene is gone. Um, yeah. PRO money, I'm sure everyone is aware, is going to dry up very, very fast, um, which is very worrying for, for which i don't understand <laughs> well i, I, I don't that. understand all we're doing right now is streaming and watching network yeah. and, it, and the pros are saying like oh your royalties are gonna go down you're like yeah. wait we're entertaining the world why would our i know royalties so, go so, down? so the reason for that is because the 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 licenses for for music to be played in public places where like bars and restaurants. Ah, okay. okay. So that's gonna and that's gonna get that knocked down by. I mean, I've heard figures up up to ninety percent. Oh, so yeah, you, yeah. You basically, one leg is getting knocked off the model, yeah. and then the other side has to deal with that. Um. So you, you, you uh, and I, I'm also a director of PRS. I should probably come out now. <laughs> <laughs> full disclosure. Yeah, full disclosure. Um, and and and. So I kind of have a strong awareness of all of these things happening. Um, Broken Record is about the fact that streaming replaced a system that was sustaining for the ecosystem badly. I mean, full of gangsterism and full of corruption and full of losers as well. But, but streaming doesn't support enough people. It really doesn't. And, and on all of the income is in a very, very small place. And this isn't a political thing. This isn't to do with fairness, really, um, which a lot of people like talking about. It's to do with the fact that you have a broken market and that nobody's doing anything about it. The value is being held down strongly by the DSPs. The major labels don't care because they're aggregating so much money. And they're the only important players for the DSPs. Yeah. And everybody else just has to sort of sit there resigned to this outcome. And that doesn't strike me as anything that anybody really wants. <laughs> as a good and place we, to be. Well, uh, I, yeah, so we've got, yeah. I, 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 just gonna say, I, th I think it's really interesting because the, uh, maybe sort of uh, the, the group of us represent various kind of uh, various experiences in this world. I mean, you know, uh, Blake, who I've done a thousand hours of network TV. Did I see that? Just like fourteen hundred. Fourteen hundred. Jesus, oh. go to sleep, mate. Wow. That's, that's yeah. Amazing. Thank you. So, so, so that and that's network TV. So, so basically, the kind of the 
the, the kind of uh, the model of um, broadcast TV with established pretty decent rates over in the States. Um, it, in a way, that kind of uh, straight down the middle, that's where the, the golden goose is, so to speak. That's just all breaking down in lots of different ways now. So, and the and the sort of plus with your plus with uh, worldwide. I mean, yeah. once like these superhero shows, they're like in fifty-five countries. So it's like it's crazy. So when you get a notice from your PRO saying, uh, "Be careful, like rates are gonna, you know, royalties are gonna drop." Like how? There's like the entire world is in quarantine right now. Yeah. But but to Tom's point, it's it's going down across the thing and and you can't you can't uh you know the way pros work they borrow from different spots so if tv is their golden goose to use your phrase michael and concerts are down you have to apportion it across the thing so i get it like everyone goes down totally and then in terms of sort of uh streaming and and how um sustainable and i'm going to just come to you how how sustainable when for instance with uh with your duo project do you look to that as like going to be a, a something that will make any money sustainably for you guys later on or is that sort of not i think streaming and i think also the figures that um that tom was sort of putting out on his on his twitter feed you know these columns I think it also depends when you're signed and you're not signed and then when you're signed what deal you've got. So I've got two I've got two ways that I release music. I have a direct artist distribution deal with The Orchard. Um, so I kind of effectively um, act as my own label. And then with Ava Waves, it's signed to One Little Indian. So, uh, so by the time everyone's percentages get taken <laughs> off and we're left with what, you know, our, our little bit. I mean, I would not I would totally not take that at the moment as being yeah. anything that would contribute to like paying for my kids' ballet lessons at, at yeah. all. Like, you know, over, like it, it doesn't, it doesn't translate for me into anything that, that I can kind of, uh, I would actually ever depend on for my, for the stuff that I release by myself. It's kind of like, it's like almost like PRS checks. Like they start, you know, it, it builds up and it's incremental and it's great in some ways when you're self releasing because you don't have, you know, making CDs, doing vinyl, pressing vinyl is expensive. Yeah. Sending out, you know, sending out your music in an envelope, going to the post office, like that's, it's time, you know, it takes time and it takes money. Um, so in, in that way, I, I kind of just see it as, as a, it's almost like a business card. It's kind yeah. of like a palette. And really, for usually for, for us, it's about getting people to go, like come see us play live. Um, nice. And obviously that, that bit is now gone. So yeah. it's like, we, I need to look at like the streaming revenues to kind of see is there is it conceivable that that becomes like a a, a, a sort of proper part of my income? Definitely. Okay. Uh, how how well, also for the five for the, oh, for the five plus, I have a question. <laughs> Hold your horse. I'm just going to ask Kate about uh, from a sort of electronic music point of view. Do you, I mean, what's your take on? Um, a sort of royalty generation and sustainability uh, in that world for you. Do you did you ever expect? Are you surprised by how what the world of streaming looks like? Um, well, I mean, it's changed so much. Because when I first started, you were only respected if your electronic music was also on vinyl. So a lot of my first releases, it was you know we we press four hundred and you know, you'd make money digitally and then, you know, kind of like not sell back all the vinyl. It's, it's hard to even just like break even on vinyl, like, you know, to be honest, um, yeah. artwork and everything else. And now then, you know, then that, I, the last couple of deals I had to, to put it in there just to say that I wanted vinyl. You know, I was used to that. I liked that. You know, if I really liked an album or something that's done dance music. And then now, I mean, I think that streaming most of the time, from what, from what I've seen um, with beat driven electronic music, it doesn't do quite as well streaming. People, you know, want to go to streaming services to have something more background music, whereas if they want to hear a mix, they'll go to Boiler Room, you know, to hear a live DJ mix, so they'll go to the uh, Mix yeah. Cloud or SoundCloud, you know, not really SoundCloud, but they want to hear DJ mixes, you know. Yeah, so yeah. if you're having people over at nine o'clock at night and you want to turn something on, I, I don't think sound, or Spotify is the go-to or the streaming services. So I, 
the, the stuff that I've done with London Electronic Orchestra that's the most chill of mm. that album is what's done the, the best because that's, you know, it gets on these sort of chill out for, I don't know what they're called, but something like these chill out <laughs> playlists. Yeah. And, and I know because one of our tracks has 10 million plays, which is a lot. And so I will tell you, Anna, you cannot live off it. <laughs> because like, because 10 million plays is more, is like, that's a lot, you know, that's a lot. And you, and, and I, and I know because I have one track that had that much that when I had an album out that was on vinyl and recouping the cost and that was with a, a label though. So when, you know, but when you're, like you said, when you get through all it, you know, it's down to the bottom of it. It's like, oh yeah, once, once we pay off the rest of the album release party costs, you know, we'll almost be there. And so it's like, yeah, not, yeah, I wouldn't pay for my, uh, I wouldn't pay for ballet off that one either. Screaming, it's just, it just seems like a lost cause. I mean, how, like, well, how many songs do you, how many plays yeah. do you need? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, well, I, 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 I hear you. I do like all these network shows and make a really good living. And then I did this show uh, called You on Netflix. And, oh, did you do that one? I didn't even realize you did that one. I can't keep up. Yeah. I just do them all. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> no, so I did you and Netflix announced that like it had 40 million views in the first two weeks. I'm like, that's gonna be sweet. Yeah. And then nine months later, you get the, the royalty statement and go, huh, that's what 40 million views is. Nice. Okay, whatever. Mate. Yeah. So our Dracula, our Dracula over Christmas is, was BBC here, but Netflix rest of the world. So do I have to send my Ferrari back? Is that what you're saying? I have to well, have to yeah. And cancel oh, it like, like Anna said, <laughs> cancel your kids' ballet classes. Yeah, don't. Now, I, I just got to go back to Tom just to round this, this bit up, just because I think that, again, kind of looking forward, if that's the theme of, a theme of this chat this week, it's kind of uh, what, what can we all do? Because everybody, everybody's experience, I think, is uh, unique and everybody's got like a take on this. But um, uh, yeah. What, what can we do, Tom? Save the day for us. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I just think get out of this um, resigned headspace for one. Right. It's, right. it's just dark and silly and, yeah. and you can change things. I mean, Anna will speak to this as well. You know, mm. politicians do listen. You can. I mean, I, I do think that people worry about tinkering with the system, who's going to win and lose. But music and entertainment is incredibly unregulated, mm. like wildly unregulated. And these and the big tech companies are even more unregulated. So we need to think. We need to really look and go. You know, as a society, do we just want these massive data aggregation uh, firms to just? You know, Google just became a trillion dollar company in January. Do 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 we want that to just be what happens while the creative industry just withers because we can't? because people can't get on the tree in the first place because you can't make enough revenue to even stay in. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it's, we re, at some point, well, I, was, I was wondering, when's this moment gonna come when everyone kind of goes, God, this is rubbish. This is not working. <laughs> and, 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 is it and now, me, Tom? Is it now? Can we, do, can we say it now? COVID, I'm sorry, but as soon as hit, I was like, this is it. If we yeah. don't all at this moment go, just cry bullshit. Mm. When else are we going to do it? You know, um, because it, it's, there's so many problems with these models and there's nothing wrong with asking for them to be fixed. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. nothing wrong with saying this doesn't actually function. Yeah. The, the, the people who, who, you know, it, it, unless Netflix pay more for people to do the music, if the royalties aren't there, mm. then all incomes are going to go down and it's a race to the bottom. And we know that already yeah. we know it so why pretend to ourselves that it's not you know yeah. how do you how do you really talk? be surprised sorry Anna. After you. how I, so i went i went to that talk that prs did i think it was in conjunction with deezer and they're and they're campaigning for i think some people are mentioning in the chat the user-centric model so the problem is at the moment is that it, the people who surprise surprise are controlling you know american the american wing of record labels they they benefit from 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 the model as it stands like how 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 do you like is the musicians union prs like is it just a case of or is it a case of our representatives getting together or is it a case of us as users or us as content providers i.e the composers and artists like how what is the way forward because i don't 
I don't, I don't see how Sony in, in the US is gonna allow a user centric system or even a, a, so it's almost like a federalized system uh, between countries. Um, well, it's about engagement and it's about pushing. I mean, it's not wildly radical what we're talking about. I mean, and I don't think I'm coming mostly from a consumer point of view. I don't I think that you need a sustainable model in order for the consumer to keep what they like. Yeah. You know, you yeah. can't just crush everything that's beautiful in the world and then expect the consumer to be happy. So 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 it's it's it, it's for me it's about you know asking for stronger representation in, in organizations with PRS, asking for organizations like PRS to ask, act stronger and to be willing to go to tribunals and test these people. I think it's about joining the MU, it's about joining the Ives Academy, it's about about finding um, like minds and all of us working together. You know, I'm as willing to go to the wire um, to, to get the BBC to, to come up with a, a, a right, correct way of, of contracting composers as I am to go up against Spotify about the way that they pay musicians. We're all on the same side. We all just need to get our act together. Yeah. Also, one of the things that I do is I realized long ago that I'm starting a project and then my agreement is going to come halfway or even after I've delivered. Yeah. And over the years I've realized that I have, I mean, none of us as composers really have leverage, but I'm like, okay, I'm doing the work and I'm going to push this point. I'm going to pick one point in my contract that really sucks for the, all the composers that will follow me. And I'm going to push that. And you know what? They're kind of going to have to give in because by the time we get to paper, I've already done half the series. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, and it's kind of fun. I'll like talk to my lawyer and go like, hey, let's push that point. That's, that's right. the way forward right here. And then by the time you get to it, it's like, wait, but he already delivered 10 episodes of 22. What are you going to do? We're going to yeah, cease yeah. and desist. And it's not like you have leverage, but it does take all five of us on this call and all 1,500, yeah. 3,000 yeah. composers working to sort of just dig in and go, I'm not afraid to be fired. I'm not afraid yeah, yeah. to be made fun of. I'm just like, this is not right. Yeah. I can't I fight you. Spotify, but I can fight like one little contract point each year. Yeah, because that comes across your actual desk. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm gonna go around with a, tr with a traditional coming towards the end sort of question, which sadly for Anna, I'll come to Anna first, because I always hate these ones, which is the, what do you think you'd be doing in 10 years time question <gasps> that gives everybody else a bit of time to think so uh future future gazing a little further uh yeah what do you think will be part of your world in 10 years time i'd love to do more writing for picture and i would love to be touring as well and just uh and yeah more walks on the beach but i think um just have a sustainable music industry just for everyone to, to kind of grow and flourish i think without kind of worrying about financial ruin <laughs> that's a really rubbish answer. i feel like you should no. go to someone else no, no, no. i know that's I, that's doing more, doing more of the same but being paid properly for it how oh, about that it? strong punchy uh mr oh. tom gray here we go you've had a, oh, you've God. had 90 God. seconds God. i'll probably join the t circus 10 years from now hey <laughs> well any particular department elephants Tigers, they don't have animals um, anymore. It's just juggling. We don't have animals anymore, so I'll have to be an acrobat. It's done. Oh, <laughs> strong, very strong call. Uh, Kate, what do you do? You because I've I've talked to um, talked to Carly. In fact, Carly was a, a guest. Uh, a, we're friends, but she was a guest really early on on, the, on this, and um, the had a conversation with her about the sort of how to get together people from slightly different backgrounds, some that can persuade producers that they're right for the show because they're experienced and others that can uh, be sort of the fairy dust, if you like, from, from a different world to put, to put together a package. Do you, do you see those sort of uh, working with somebody else deals as part of your 10-year uh, plan? Yeah, definitely. I I've honestly have not thought of the 10-year plan in like 10 years, so this is a really good question. I think, um, yeah, there's a lot to, to think about, but I mean, I really would echo... Um, what Anna was saying, like, you know, and that's something since, since having my child, that's, that's been a major yeah. thing where I've stood up for getting paid, um, you know, standing up for, yeah, when you're looking at a contract, just 
it's pulling out whatever you can from it. Um, I totally agree with what Blake said. In mine, my point is uh, soundtrack rights so that I can release the soundtrack and I just mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. that from the beginning so that I know that I can release that and I can use it as a calling card. And no matter what happens with the film, it's like people can hear the music. Um, but yeah, 10, 10 years from now, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to be working more doing electronic with live orchestra and collaborations, um, possibly teaming up with some composers and, you know, <laughs> you know, creating a duo or, you know, working with others. I've, I, you know, I love collaborating and, and you know, being a composer, um, like, the way I say it, it's like you have the drought when nothing's happening yeah, and then yeah, it's yeah. just torrential downpour. So <laughs> <laughs> collaboration could be yeah, a yeah. very healthy thing. And, oh, um, for, for yeah. sure. Uh, <laughs> Blake, uh, 10 years time, you, I, I, when are you going to stop? Because you, <laughs> when are you going to stop mean, so that I can do your work? Basically, that's the question that I'm asking. Uh, well, in the last year, I've done a lot of of collaborations, and oh, yeah. oh, nice. like this, this kind of sucks. Like sitting in the dark room by myself and just yeah. making. So, in the last year, I reached out to a lot, of, and I've been working with different artists, different composers. And so I see a lot more of that. And um, you four are on my target now. Yeah. Uh, it's just change your email address. It'll be fine. It's it's just... like we, can, we can do this together. And it doesn't have, I mean, it's not about ego. It's about making yeah. cool music. So I, I don't know. I think hopefully in 10 years I've stopped and you can take it over. But Come on. Um, I've, I've, I've got no work. You know, all my has been cancer. <laughs> exactly. Am I going to bring up Prague? No, don't go to Prague. Let, nobody talks about Prague. <laughs> but no, I, 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 I like collaborations. And I oddly think that this, even though we're isolated, it's making us want to work more with people yeah. in a weird yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so sure. I think this might really get us to the collaboration point where, you know, it's, it's, it's strange what's happening that we're so isolated that we just need to, I, I can't do this by myself. Please yeah. do it with me. We need to reach out, don't we? Uh, so ladies and gents, we unbelievably have come round to uh, three minutes to the hour, which is is nuts. Quality chat, I think you would agree. I think that was, uh, I would love to be in here. Uh, so uh, we will still be going. We're still going. I promise to carry on doing this until, I don't know, some arbitrary time when it feels like we're back to normal again. I, who knows? I mean, I just, what will what will normal look like um but it, if you uh, would like to uh, join the facebook group if you haven't uh, joined the discord server if you haven't uh, please uh, check this out again on youtube subscribe to the youtube channel etc etc because i think it's just uh hopefully a slightly um civilizing and uh, a little little boost on a monday certainly for me i i love these I love doing these chats. It's, it's great to see everybody here. So I'm just going to go around just for a little goodbye, possibly in the form of a physical wave. Feel free to express yourself how you like. So bye-bye from Anna. Amazing. She's got the nicest studio that we've seen, or actually on the whole chat series, I think, so far. Uh, from <laughs> Sitel, okay. Look at that. This is slightly, uh, I think, it's back to the contemporary dance, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Incredibly yeah. grateful. And and down the line from LA, Mr. Blake Neely. Well done. You can go and have I'm a sleep. I'm going to sleep now. now. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> I'm a proper sleep. So thanks to everybody on the chat. Thank you so much for everybody who contributed down there. Uh, we've all been reading as we've been listening to. So really appreciate everybody showing up live. It uh, makes it into a, a lovely exchange. Uh, so thanks very much. And I'll see everybody same place, same time next week. Bye-bye all. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> bye, -bye. bye. bye.